Hello, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our IBM Developer Tech Talk series, uh, A Cloud Native Story with our partner Console. I'm glad you are joining us today. And uh, my name is Marian. I'm your host today, and I'm part of the IBM Developer Advocacy team here in Germany, and I live in Berlin. We usually start our online uh, talks by asking asking you, the participants, where are you all from? Where are you joining us from? So feel free to tell us in the chat where you are joining us from. I'm eager to hear. Um, I'm saying hello from Berlin. Ah, Lukas from Munich, cool. So, oh. Hi, Miriam from Berlin. Yay. Oh, Marco from Cologne. Very cool. Um, meanwhile, for all, of, uh, for all of you who don't know what IBM Developer is uh, all about, I would like to say a couple of words about us, who we are, and what we are doing. Uh, so IBM Developer or IBM Developer Advocacy is actually the IBM's initiative to reach out to developers in the ecosystems, and um, we we are we are a global team with developer advocates all around the world, like in the UK, in San Francisco, in Tel Aviv, and um, our mission is to inspire, to enable, and share our knowledge with um, developers, uh, and talk about topics like new technologies, open source, data, uh, cloud and AI. And um, we usually do that um, on top of our three pillars, which are code, content, and community. And I would like to tell you a little bit about it. So regarding the code, there are tons of code snippets and um, 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 coding patterns, patterns on our website, developer.ibm.com. And I'm going to share the links in the chat. Uh, in a little while and for the content part all of our developer advocates are writing blogs they're creating videos and they are even active in the social media so if you have any questions um, feel free to contact us there I uh, I'm going to uh, paste a couple of links uh, in the chat in a, in a short minute as well and all of that comes together on our third pillar which is community and that is you right so um, we are actually doing a ton of um, free developer activities and events um, with our developer advocates, with experts uh, around the world, and uh, we are doing workshops, free conferences, and webinars and tech talks. So um, if you haven't had the chance to, um, to see our local events on on our meetup so feel free to join our community because we put all the activities we are doing um, uh, we post them on in that uh, in that meetup group and i'm going to share that link in the chat in a, in a while i just can't uh, type while i'm speaking so um having that said and before we jump in the sec uh, into, into the session i would say one more word about uh, the crowdcast platform so if you have questions, please uh, use the ask a question section um, so we can make sure your questions actually get answered. And please feel free to be active in the chat. I, uh, I'm going to monitor it while um, Marco is, um, Marco is uh, speaking. And last but not least, um, I'm going to put on the bottom of the session, I'm going to put important links for you. Um, so just um, as you see right now, for example, the free IBM cloud registration link, which uh, makes it possible for you to get your hands um, on the code and you know just develop the stuff Mark is telling us um, in, a, in a minute yourself. So with that all said, <laughs> I'm going to jump right into our session. Um, which is, by the way, the first part of a whole Tech Talk series with our partner, Console. And um, 
today we have our special guest Marco Bungard from Consul um, with us and Marco is going to share his experience and um, uh, and will take us on a journey on how you got to go fast with Quarkus. So Marco, I will hand over to you and uh, the stage is yours. You might want to say a couple of words to you and I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you, Marion. I hope you can hear me. Um, before we start, I would like to share the link to the slides with you. Um, in case you want to join along during my talk or in case you can't see the slides on the screen. Um, it's a bit.ly link, so just for you to see that it's uh, not really a harmful link or something malicious behind it, I'm going to share my screen now and open this link. So you can see um, the link redirects to SlideShare and you can follow along. So um, as mentioned before, if you have questions, please use the question feature. Marion will interrupt me while I'm talking so I can answer the questions. Um, the topic for today is Quarkle, the blue hedgehog of Java web frameworks. And let's dive right in. Uh, a few words to me. Uh, my name is Marco Bungrad. I work at Consul. Um, our main uh, department is situated in Munich. Our site department where I'm working is situated in uh, Dusseldorf. I was a PhD student in Kassel from 2013 to 2018. And 2008 to 2013, I studied bioinformatics and computer science in Vienna. If you want to follow me or contact me or uh, ask questions, normally I go by the handle of Turing85. And whenever you see this little penguin, chances are this is me. So feel free to ask. Uh, and my main interests besides Quarkus are also Keycloak, which will be the topic of the next talk, and GrawlVM. So let's get started. Quarkus. Um, a uh, quick show of hands. Who of you ha is working with JEE or Jakarta EE? Could you please write in chat yes or here, just so I get a feeling what crowd I'm talking to. I see one yes. If you don't, please uh, write no, so I get a feeling. I uh, see so a thumbs up. No, 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 no. More no's than yes. OK, great. Next question, who of you is working with Spring Boot? Spring Boot, I see yes, yes, yes. Probably lots of yes, both, awesome. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, who of you has heard of either Graal, VM or Quarkus? Yes, yes, I think mess is meant to be yes, 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 Quarkus, yes, yes and yes. Okay, awesome. And final question, who of you has um, worked with Quarkus either in private project or in production? Uh, a private for private project, production for production, and no, uh, no Quarkus for never heard. Not yet, private, no. Awesome, exactly the right crowd to ask. So we have some people that are familiar with Java EE. I will explain in a minute why this might be important. So a lot of people that are familiar with Spring Boot and some that had, have heard either of Quarkus or GraalVM. So what is Quarkus? Um, Quarkus is a uh, framework designed or a stack designed by Red Hat and describes itself as a Kubernetes native Java stack. So it is pretty lightweight, lightweight in the sense of we, our application that we wired to have a small memory footprint. Um, we can compile to binary, which is pretty new for Java. Uh, if you may remember, Java has the, uh, is known for being, um, heavy weighted, memory consumption heavy, uh, artifacts are big. So some of these uh, points are addressed when you comply to uh, native code. The memory footprint gets even lower than we are on uh, Java execution. Um, single instances may have worse performance. So the point for native compilation is not to boost performance, but to lower the footprint of the application. So in return, we can 
um, deploy more applications and through deploying more applications or more instances of the same application, we get a be better performance have a net gain. And also we can be up and running with Quarkus within minutes and I will demonstrate that shortly. So why should you use Quarkus? Um, I have two slides for this. The first slide is to motivate you as a developer and the second slide is to motivate your boss or your decision maker why he should uh, decide for Quarkus. Um, Quarkus puts developer joy front and center. Yeah, it's developer, developed by developers for developers and it has excellent Maven and Gradle integration. We'll see that in a minute as well. And we have a really, really powerful dev mode um, with a feedback loop. If you're familiar with the um, hot replacement in Spring Boot, you may be familiar that there are corner cases where Spring Boot cannot quite keep up. For example, if you change method signature and the like, um, this is addressed in Quarkus with the dev mode. Not everything works. We will see a corner case where it doesn't work, but in most cases, you can start your application in uh, in this dev mode, leave it running, change the code, and you are able to see the code replacement instantly. Um, Quarkus uses a curated list of dependencies. This is necessary for primarily for native compilation because the um, dependencies must be native compilation ready. Um, Red Hat themselves described them as best of the breed. Uh, when Caracas came out, most of the dependencies were uh, for one pretty limited. So you had only one dependency for your persistence layer. You had only one dependency for your web layer and so on. Over the time, the uh, multitude of this dependent dependency grew. Some are created by Red Hat, some are created by the community and it's uh, ongoing and uh, steadily growing. Um, furthermore, when we start or restart our app, it will normally start within milliseconds. And that's also a feature that we'll see in a second. Uh, so what should you say to your boss or decision maker why, why they should um, bet on Quarkus? Quarkus is based on um, open standards, namely Java EE and Jakarta, as well as MicroProfile. So you don't have any proprietary dependencies. You have um, open dependencies or open uh, APIs you connect to, um, all based on an open standard. We have features and that we all know and love, live dependency injection, JPA, open API matrix, uh, tracing, tolerance, and so on. And there's a second part uh, to Quarkus um, that supports reactive programming through Mutiny. Mutiny is a um, project uh, belonging to Quarkus itself. It is internally based on Vertex. Um, this part is proprietary in the sense that there is not an open standard for reactive programming, but um, Re Mutiny itself is compatible, uh, provides compatibility with um, known, well-known reactive frameworks like Rx Java and Pro Project Reactor. So that's there's no new surprising stuff. It's um, in a new design, it's not called Newton and has its own con uh, constructs, but the constructs are very similar to the known constructs. So let us go fast. If you want to bootstrap a new application, there's one simple command you can execute. The commands are shown here, one for Maven, one for Gradle. You may notice that the uh, Gradle uh, Bootstrap also uses the uh, Maven installation on your machine, but over the build tools equals Gradle, you are telling the system, yes, I'm bootstrapping through Maven, but I want to bootstrap for Gradle. So um, you need Maven to bootstrap, but from there on, on out, you can use Gradle exclusively. Let's take a look how this might look like. I'm switching to my console over here. Um, quick question to Chad and to Marion. Um, can you read the slides? Can you read the screen? Or do I have to wait a little longer so the um, slides and screen get cleared up by artifacting? I hear some typing. So far, so good. Awesome. Yeah, it looks, looks OK. Very, very good. So let me find the right terminal. This one. And I'm going to copy this command right here. 
So in this talk, I will be using Maven. I'm more of a Maven guy. Um, so sorry, Gradle users, but it should work nevertheless. I'm just going to copy the, this command and we'll execute it. And we'll take a look afterwards what has happened. So we see Maven is running and our project is created. If I do a ls, you can see down here, a new folder, my artifact ID was created. And when I switch to IntelliJ and open this project, TMP, you can have a look on the project that was created for us. I will switch to presentation mode so you are able to see the code. Oh, a little bit too slow. Come on. Uh, I think, ah yeah, here we go. Um, presentation mode. Oh, come on. Presentation mode. So we have a project structure right here. My artifact ID, source, main, Docker, Java. We have one class created for us with one simple endpoint called hello and just returning some hello. Okay, that's all we uh, get from the bootstrap. Now let us start up this application. We switch to the folder, my artifact ID. And I will show you a little bit uh, of the aforementioned um, Maven Dev2, uh, Quarkus Dev2. For the, this, we execute MVN Quarkus colon dev. This will build and start our application. So we see right here, we have a debug port set. So we are able to connect the debugger to it and our application has started. So now I'm going to configure a debug connection in IntelliJ, remotes, exactly. We will name this debug, uh, my artifact ID, apply, run. Normally the first one doesn't work exactly. And when I run it through here, Exactly, we are connected to the debug port. We can set a debug point right here. Oh, not run. You can set right here. And we are going to make a post request. The application is running on localhost, HTTP, localhost, 8080 slash hello slash hello. We trigger the endpoint. And when I write a colon instead of a period, it should work exactly. We are getting into the debug session. Um, I think you are all familiar with this. This is just to show, okay, we are able to start our application in this Quarkus dev mode. We are able to connect the debugger and we can debug our code. We can then return and see here Okay, hello has been returned. Um, now I'm going to change this response from hello to hi. Save it and redo the uh, request. And you see, we already got the change. If I go back to the um, console where the uh, Quarkus dev is running, you can see that Quarkus dev restarted it didn't restart when I saved, but it restarted when I made the first request after the save. The restart was quite fast, 0 0.190, uh, 191 seconds. And we have our changes already live. Okay, questions so far? Or are you, are you all satisfied? There have been no questions in the ask a question section yet, and I haven't seen any in the um, in the chat. But I will um, tell you if anything is going on. Awesome. So, as you can see, 
this little bootstrap here is pretty minimal. And um, normally we may need more stuff, in, in particular more libraries to really work with. Um, how can we do this? Let me slow it back to my slides here. Um, we can, for one, list through Maven all dependencies that for Quarkus are available, whoops, um, as well as in Gradle. And we can also add new dependencies. So let's execute the first command. I will switch back to this part. If I take this command right here and let me terminate this, execute it. I'm in the root project, my artifact ID, and just running Quarkus list extensions. I get a pretty long list of all extensions available for us in Quarkus. And you can pick and choose the extension you need. Another way is uh, that you uh, look for what you need on the Quarkus website and edit it uh, and uh, look for it manually. Um, this list right here can be pretty exhaustive and overwhelming. So I recommend look at the website, which extension you need. And the next step would be to not only list the extensions, but add an extension. For example, we can take this command right here. Don't worry, I will link uh, to the Quarkus page where all these commands are shown in a second. With this command, I'm telling uh, uh, Maven, hey, I want to add the, in this case, um, Hibernate Validator extension. When I execute this command, it's pretty fast, it shouldn't take long, build successful. Let me switch back to IntelliJ to POM XML. And when we are looking for a Hibernate validator, we see this section right here was added through the Maven command. So let me share the link with you. If you want to follow along or take a look around, those are the links for Quarkus Maven and Quarkus Gradle integration. Any questions so far? I think if there were, Marion would have told me so. So what are we going to do today? This up to this point was only motivation. And today we are going to bootstrap a project. We have seen how already how this is done. We are going to implement two microservices, one for users and one for colors. <clears throat> in the final version, each user is going to have a favorite color and decolorize start in another microservice. So we need some communication between the microservices. Um, each the microservice have their own databases according to the 12 factor um, app design pattern. Um, we need um, communication between these microservices. And in the process, we are going to look at some basics. Uh, so what, how, what, is, uh, what can general tools am I able to use? How can I integrate them? Um, how can I write a simple REST API, dependency injection, persistence, exception mapping, validation, open API metrics. And in the second part, when we are going to add the second microservice, so the first part is only based on one microservice. The second microservice uh, shows us how we can enable REST communication between two microservices. We will see how we can enable tracing with Jira, which will be the uh, entry point for another talk in the future. And we will implement some basic health and health checks and resiliency. So I am going to switch to the actual project we are going to use. This is this one. I am going to link it in chat. Uh, I think it's linked on the slides already, so I do not uh, need to relink it. All the code I'm presenting from now on, on is available on GitHub. You can find the links in the slides. And um, please use the commits as guidance. The gui commits are designed to guide you through the application step by step and explain what is done and uh, how it is done. We will start at the first commit. Pretty much a little bit larger version of our demo project. Let's us take a look around. We have a user service. Um, here we just return one static user, so no, no, depend, no um, database layer, nothing. But what we have integrated already is some um, Lombok, so we don't have to write as much code. 
Um, exactly. And I would like to show you how this is done in Quarkus. Uh, for Lombok, you have to specify that you're using Lombok in the uh, dependency management section. Um, plus, we have a small Lombok config for some general um, configuration. If you have worked with Lombok before, um, I think you should be familiar with this. Um, Lombok allows you to generate um, basic methods for POJOs like getter, setter, builders, and so on. Important notice here, when you're using Lombok, Lombok um, runs at compilation time, and the Quarkus dev mode doesn't really play nice with Lombok since um, Quarkus dev makes a Delta compile, so it co tries to compile only the classes that were changed and does it internally, not over the normal Java C or Java um, compiler. So Lombok doesn't get triggered, meaning if you uh, change Lombok annotations or have new classes with Lombok annotations, uh, you might see some exceptions. This is a point where you would have to uh, stop the dev mode, restart it, restart it, and then it should work. Okay. Let me switch over to this point. Um, we are going to start this little application of uh, MVN Quarkus dev. It's pretty much the same as before. Um, since we don't use any database layer, we are just going... Oh, that's funny. This part doesn't quite work because I have to clean the project first. Um, There's also a fa artifact of Quarkus dev. Sometimes you should um, add the clean before the Quarkus dev so the project compiles. Otherwise, there might be a class on the class path that are not long, no longer valid and you could have exceptions like this one. So our application is started up. And when I now call the one endpoint we have, Indeed, we are seeing the user we specified, static user returned with uh, username Alice, email alice at wonder.land. So the next step would be to add some persistence and endpoints to get and post new users. Let's take a look right here. Um, in this talk, I'm going to use um, Hibernate Panache. That's a special uh, um, Hibernate provider explicitly developed for Quarkus. Um, there are also providers for the normal Hibernate with um, JPQL, and there are also bridges to Spring Boot, but I think they are quite well known. And I would rather show you something new than something you already know. So what are we doing right here? For one, if we take a look at our dependencies, we see here already, okay, we have some Hibernate ORM. We are telling um, the dependencies we want to use Panache, and we are going to use a Postgres database. That's really everything that's changed. Everything else was here before. Ah, no, not true. One change we also made, um, we loaded a Quarkus dependency to configure our application through YAML files instead of um, application.properties. So let us take a look at our application.yaml. We see our database connection is set up right here. Uh, we are using Postgres. That will be the user, password, link to the database. And we also define here the port the application is going to run. This will be important later when we have two apps. So the, both apps use different ports um, pre-specified so we can run them on, the, on our local machine. What I've um, added um, additionally is a local deployments folder with a Docker Compose. And here we are just going to start a Postgres container and initialize our users and databases we are going to use. In this case, we are using Postgres 13. And we initialize our app user table, app user user with password and so on. So let me start up the database, Let's see the local deployments, um, docker compose app minus D. So our database is up and running. Um, with persistence, we need a representation of our anti uh, 
business entities, in this case, our user entity. Um, I think most of you should be familiar with the annotations. I defined the entity tables, um, some uh, Lombok annotations for constructors, builder, data basically says yeah, I need getters and setters, and the table structure. Furthermore, I have incorporated um, Flyway in the project as not here, but on the root level, Flyway. I have incorporated Flyway, so we can defy our database migration and set up tables with um, Flyway, which we can also see right here, resources, DB, config for the configuration used in Maven. And in the migration folder, we set up the actual table with its sequence so we can start using it. Um, we can execute this by saying Quarkus uh, user plugin flyby migrate. This will initialize the table for us as we specified in this file right here. Exactly. Uh, please ignore the warning. Warning is uh, telling us that the current Flyway plugin um, does not support um, Postgres 13.1, but since we are not using 13.1 specific features, it should be fine. So let us take a look at how the application evolved on the resource level. For one, when you look at the service, um, we see here that we have a get user by username method. Um, we are calling the repository to find the user. Okay, nothing uh, extraordinarily. And map it, map it from an entity to an DTO. This is done by a, uh, by a separate class. We have a response class, user response, right here, which is quite similar to the entity class, but missing the primary key ID. And the mapping is done through a plugin called um, MapStruct, which allows us to just define the interface. And the mapping is done by convention. So if they are the same uh, fields with same types, mapping is done automatically. Um, this is all we need for mapping, for one, the uh, user to the response and a request, which we'll see in a second, to a user. So. This layer here is our communication layer, um, which we will receive over the REST endpoints, request and response. And we are mapping them down to our business object in a quite slim manner. So the second method we see right here is the create user method. Um, it is going to write something to the database, so we need it to be uh, transactional. Um, we are making some requests to verify, okay, no name, no user with the same name and with the same email already exists. And if that's so, please persist the new user. Um, persistence is done through the user repository. And as I mentioned before, this is a um, Panache repository. Panache is a little bit different to the uh, kinds you may, may be familiar with. For example, right here, um, this find method is deny, uh, defined in the repository. In the query, we can define a partial query of what we want to match. In this uh, case, we want to match, uh, in lowercase, the username, that is the username column in the database, to the variable username to lowercase, and we want to return the first result as optional. Uh, same is done with the email. So we have a case insensitive search for username and email in the repository. Awesome. So that now that we have done this, um, we are going to start on our Maven Quarkus application. And we are going to post and get some users. I have created a post request right here. So application is still starting up. So here is it is. So we can now post a user. For example, in this case, a new user called Alice with the email alice at wonder.land. And indeed, we get the correct response. The user was persisted. And if I now go over here and say, I want to get user by the name Alice, 
I get the ex uh, expected result. To show you that there are no tricks up my sleeve, I would like to open the, come on, database con connection to the user database and show you in the user table that well, indeed we have a persistent user Alice at Wonder.land. As we, as we have seen before, we deny creating a user with the same name twice. So when we now create a new user with the same name, uh, we get quite an ugly exception. Yeah? When we are, this is an HTML page and when we scroll down, we see a stack trace. Do we see a stack trace? We see a parcel stack trace up here um, with a user already exists exception. Um, this is an exception we explicitly uh, throw when a user is already present. Let me show you this uh, here. Here we throw this exception. No, no, not here, here. User already exists, so user already exists. If either the username is already present or the email. Um, in the same manner, if we are looking for a user that does not exist, so if we say user does not exist, we get an ugly exception as well. So the next topic we are going to look at is exception mapping. I'm going to check out this, brand, this commit right here. And the only thing that has changed is um, in boundary exception mapping, we have added two classes, no such user exception mapper and user already exists exception mapper. Both have a method to respond, listen to an exception and map this response or this exception to an uh, actual response. In this uh, case, if no user is found, we uh, return a 404 with a meaningful error code and error message and user already exists exception is going to throw a bad request with the uh, code already exists and then meaningful exception map method. So if we now retry this request, first we are going to look for a user that doesn't exist. We see in a second, okay, now we are getting a nice formatted um, response, the status code is uh, 404 not found, and we see error code not found, user with username does not exist, does not exist. The same goes for posting the same user twice. If I now um, repost user Alice here, I'm going to get an exception already exists, user with username Alice already exists. So. You see, exception mapping is quite simple in this manner, and all we had to do was add these two classes and one dependency in our POM XML. Uh, no, not even dependency. I lied. So we just had to add these two classes, and that's it. Next, um, we are going to add some validation through Hibernate validation to our project. Um, as we have seen in the um, section about setting up or bootstrapping your pro project, we need a dependency for this. In this case, we have, have the Hibernate validator dependency right here. And we are going to validate on our input parameters, meaning of our boundary request parameter, cre create user request. Um, we want the username to be of max size 255 and not null, and the email should be an actual email. Yeah? That's all we need to have basic validation. What we are going to do additionally is, um, if this validation fails, a constraint violation exception uh, is thrown, and we can map this exception through uh, some method calls to give us a nice um, way to print the exception in a me meaningful way. What we are doing here is extracting which field was violated, what was the value of the field, and what was the reason for rejection. So if we go back to posting something, let's say we take here Bob, and as email, we just say Bob. 
remember, we specified the email should in fact be an email and we execute this. We see error code is a constraint violation. Parameter email equals bot must be a well-formatted email address. Okay, that's awesome. And for the other, we are going to uh, say Bob test. Seventy. These are seventy characters. One forty to eighty. This should be too long. Above two fifty-five, and we now execute this part and see email bot is, must be well formatted email address. New line parameter username with value hmm. size must be between zero and two fifty-five. So with the addition of one um, dependency, a few annotations, and one mapper, we have already meaningful uh, mapping for our validation exception. So do we have questions so far? No. No, no awesome. Yet. Awesome. Uh, next I would like to discuss is um, Open API and Swagger. So documenting your API. Um, again, we are going to need one dependency. Uh, this, this one right here, Quark is small right open API. And we are going to annotate our user resource. Um, I think most of you will be familiar with this annotations. What is uh, What should be noted? And this is not a third party API we are using here. If we take a look into the, opera in the operation class, for example, we see this is um, defined by micro profile. So here we are based on a well-defined standard, open source standard. We don't couple to any um, vendor locked in specific uh, solution. Um, with this, we are going to generate our open A API declaration. Um, for this, I know I have to restart Quarkus, otherwise I'm not able to um, access the Swagger UI. With the definition of our open API, we have already enabled the access to a Swagger UI, which we'll use in a second to show that uh, this is working as, as expected. So the application is started. We are going to localhost 8080 slash swagger minus UI. Ooh. Swagger minus UI. And this is our swagger application documentation. Uh, we can now come over here, say, okay, I want to post a new user, Claire uh, at clear. Username Claire. Execute. We see down here this is the response we got. Username Claire is clear. Um, it's a documented response we got. So everything is fine. If I re execute this part, we see we get a 400 bad request. This is documented as well. And we see here the exact response. We can do the same thing for the get endpoint. Um, for time's sake, I'm going to skip this part, but we see already we have a well-defined uh, open API definition and a Swagger front end. The only thing missing is some general um, information about this API right here. This is what we are going to uh, look at next. We are going to check out this branch. And in this branch, uh, the only chair, uh, this commit, the only thing we changed is we added some information to um, the application.yaml, this part right here. We defined um, uh, version info for our, our API, a description, and some contact information. Now, if I'm going to refresh this page, we see here, okay, users API, contact Marco Bungard. If we click here, we can you can send an email to me everything as expected. So we have an easy way to give our um, open API documentation a meaningful, meaningful header. So next up, um, we are now going in the territory of um, cloud native solutions. We are going to add some meter information to observe our application. 
again, we added just one dependency and we are going for the boundary user resource. We are defining here, I want to count all invocations of this method. I want to meter them, which means I'm going to get some timing information in quantiles and I want the absolute time. We have these annotations defined on both our methods. So get and post, they have um, meaningful names, get user count with a description, get user meter with a description, get user timer and for post, the post correspondence. Um, here again, I know that I have to restart the application. Otherwise this will not work. Localhost 8030 matrix application, wait for the app to come up. So we are online and we see here already, already with these few annotations that these are the sets we are getting. And you're looking for get user. We see count, for example, um, we see the endpoint was invoked zero times. Now let me go over to Postman and set up some requests. One, two, three, four, five. We should now see if I re when I refresh that we have a five right here, exactly we have. And we see some timing information down here. So um, for this, we have defined our um, meter information, which we then, for example, can consume with um, Prometheus or other monitoring tools. Okay, now we are going to make the jump to the second service. Um, the second service is the color service. It's quite similar to the user service, but instead of users, we are going to work with colors. Okay, my IntelliJ is thinking about the changes I just made. Give me a second so the application doesn't freeze. Uh, this is our business object. Um, we say, okay, each color hex has a hex deck code, each color has a name, and each color is going to have a primary ID in the database. For the local deployment script, I added a second database created, and this, uh, this um, service is using the second database. Um, what we are going to do now is um, we want to add a favorite color to our users. And when we create a user, um, the user service should check is the second and uh, the favorite color actually present or was it uh, is not yet created. If it's not created, please give me an error message telling me so. So we need communication between these two services. I'm going to go to this part right here, check out. And we are, for this, we are using MicroProfile REST client. We incorporate an uh, extension for this. And in boundary, we see here the color REST client defined as an interface. And the interface mirrors the implementation of the REST endpoint. So you see here, for example, producers, path, get, path, path parameter. This looks like a REST endpoint. Um, but since it's annotated with register, register uh, REST client, um, the actual implementation will be provided through a micro profile for us. And this config key right here tells us um, the config key we can configure this REST client under in our application.yaml. Indeed, if we take a look at application.yaml um, down here, color REST MP REST URL here, is uh, the URL defined for contacting the color service. And with this part, we say um, we want the um, REST client to be a singleton since it's stateless. So you uh, can, uh, we only need to define it once in our whole application. Um, along with that, we defined the response type. This is copied from the um, color service to mimic a um, nothing shared architecture. So even though we could link the other project, the color project, since we want uh, nothing shared with the color project, we are just defining the response here. For invocation, let's take us a look into the user service. Um, 
before this, I had the getter and the constructor auto generated by Lombok. This is no longer possible because um, in the constructor, we have to annotate the rest client with, with at rest client. Otherwise, injection will not work. This is the reason why the constructor right here is um, written explicitly uh, rather than implicitly through Lombok. And for uh, using this um, interface, you can see down here how it's working. We are just going to call color rest client get color by name. We don't actually care for the return type right here. We neglect it. We only want to see does this call succeed or not. If this call is going to throw a web application exception, then we are going to assume that the color does not exist. We throw a no such entity exception. In this case, map this exception in uh, to a 404 error that uh, will then be shown to us. So for this, I am going to a restart my deployment docker compose down this will shut down the database system and delete all users i've prime uh, created beforehand let me take a quick look what is called while you are taking problem. a look there's actually a question marco oh um, awesome yeah, um, uh, Bijan Riesenberg asked, any plans for implementing something like uh, Swagger API, Swagger code gen for Quarkus? It seems to be a GitHub. Uh, um, um, as far as okay. I'm um, aware, so you are talking about taking a specification and uh, transforming it to code. As far as I know, um, they are working on it, but it's not yet ready. That's uh, the information I have on this part so far. So, so I hope this answers your question. Uh, uh, if it doesn't, please uh, tell us in the chat and we are trying to clarify. So exactly now it's running. Um, since I have recreated the database, I have to execute the flyby migration again. Once for user, once for color. Remember, we have now two databases since we have two microservices. First migration was successful. Second migration is hopefully successful. Yes. Now we are going to post a new color. Um, in this case, we are going to post the color red. So FF0000 red, let's, I think I should also start the services. This is the user service for once, and this is the color service, MVN, Quarkus, Dev, MSD debug, 506. Um, I'm defining another debug port for this uh, application to start, so I can have both running and can connect if something goes wrong to both of the applications. Uh, not colon, but equals. So start up. Color services yeah, running, user service is running, and now we are going to post a new color. You see the color is created. We can fetch this color. Right. And now when we post the user, um, we have modified our request to include a favorite color. So let's say we have Alice with Alice at wonder.land. And we are going to give her a favorite color does, that does not exist just for testing. Let us see. And we actually get a meaningful response, not found color with name does not exist, does not exist. If we now pass along a color red, then we persist Alice with, with her favorite color red. And while doing this, um, the backend made a call, or the user backend made a call to the color backend, fetched this data and validated, yes, color red does exist. 
So now comes, at least for me, the most interesting part. We are going to add Yera to the system. Um, if you are not uh, familiar with Yera, Yera is a tool that money uh, that visualizes communication from request to response, and we can trace the communication within our system. Um, again, we have to add a dependency, a little bit of configuration. Um, the main configuration is done here, where we specify, okay, we have a Yera pod that I'm going to start in a second through Docker. Um, it's running on this pod, this URL. Um, sample uh, means only I want to constantly sample 100%, therefore the one, of this application and the application should be known as user service. Uh, in color, we have a similar configuration with the only change being this service called color service. Uh, Marco, and there has been another question. Yes. So as Quarkus compiles to a native executable, do you have to compile on the target architecture or can you compile anywhere with some options defining the target? Um, uh, Gregor thinks Go does so. Um, I know that Go does this. Um, I think there are possibilities, and this is not directly uh, a question for Quarkus, but for GraalVM. I know that there are some is some work being done for GraalVM to enable this feature. Um, I'm not quite sure how stable this is. The normal way to go would be compile your Quarkus application within a pod to a native binary and copy it from this pod to the uh, deployment part, if you want to have, or to your registry, wherever your um, artifact is going to live. So this should normally be the uh, be the way to go. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. And if it didn't, uh, please uh, state it in the chat and uh, we are trying to clarify. Okay. Thanks. So I need to restart. So you may notice there are some uh, large changes for in for example adding um Yera to the system where you actually have to restart uh, quarkus normally on the day-to-day -day business when your application is set up and all the basics are done uh, you don't have to restart the application as often as we do right now so both pods are started and we are going to declare a new user bob bob at Build up there and uh, committing exactly. So we have now created a new user Bob, and we are going to localhost one six six eight six. This is the um, Yera instance, and we see up here already we have two services to select from. We're going to take a look at the um, color service. Say, find me the traces, and we see already. Wait a minute, I was looking for the color service, but I'm seeing something related to the user service right here. Yeah. If I now click on this pen, I will see, ah, okay, the actual request to color service is down here, but it was triggered through the user service. So you can see here the user service made two queries. These are the queries to verify there's not a user with this name, there's not a user with this email. Then it made a call to the color service. The color service made a query to look up the color back to the user service, which made another query to, uh, oh, let me take a look. That's another cool feature. We can actually see the uh, SQL query right here. Um, this, is what, this was to um, generate the next sequence value for the newly created user. And finally, an update on the database table to insert the new user. So with quite simple configuration, it's this part right here, a little bit of configuration right here to tell um, JDBC, please use the tracing uh, driver, and this is the tracing driver to use. Uh, this is the driver to use, this is the dialect to use. We have set up a quite powerful tool to enable monitoring and observation on our part. And this will be the base of one of the uh, following uh, talks where we are going to look at Istio. So I'm seeing I'm running low on time. 
Um, question to Marion, question to Chet. I have a little bit more to show. Shall we go over time or should we cut it right here? Let me take a look in the chat. I see one go ahead. Over time, please. Over time. Marion, that's fine by you. Yes, absolutely, yes, it's absolutely fine. Please, um, if, uh, if the audience is saying go on, then please go on. Okay, so <clears throat> now we are knee deep in cloud native territory. And uh, if you're working, uh, working with cloud native, one thing you absolutely must have are um, health check endpoints. Health check endpoints um, tell the um, cloud platform, when is your application ready? When is your application not ready or not live? Meaning it cannot process requests due to some dependency error or due to some internal error. Um, this enables, for example, Kubernetes to kill your application, restart it, or to uh, detect that the application is not able to come up, meaning to uh, boot properly. To enable this, um, again, the only thing we have to do, at least for the uh, basic setup is to add uh, one dependency. Um, uh, I think I added, it. let me take a look. The dependency, ah, wrong pom. That's why I'm not finding anything. Um, this dependency right here, we just say um, we want this dependency in our application. Um, for time's sake, I'm just going to reboot the um, user service right here. And with this, we are going to get access to an URL, local host 8080 slash health. Let's wait for the application to start up. Listening, come on. Um, you have to understand uh, Quark is running reboot in um, debug mode. That's why it's taking so long. It's re compiling classes and so on. Normally, when the uh, class, uh, class are compiled, a startup is much, much faster. So now we can access localhost 8080, which is our user service, and say slash health. And this is what we have already. So we have a check for the database connection, um, the database up. And now we can look at one once ready, ready is the um, check for the database connection, meaning if the application starts up and the application isn't there, this check will be on down. And after a certain time, Kubernetes, for example, could decide this application is unhealthy, I'm going to terminate it. And when the application keeps getting stuck, stuck during restart, it can roll back to the previous uh, version, which hopefully was um, is uh, valid and can start up. Then we have a second category uh, named live. Um, here are no default ch uh, checks defined, but what, what we could do is, for example, define a health check from the user to the color service. So when the color service goes down, the user server uh, says, I'm no, uh, no longer alive. I cannot process requests. And in return, Kubernetes or the load balancer knows I'm not supposed to forward requests to this port or uh, this application since it's not able to process them due to uh, liveness checks. Exactly. Then let us take a look at fault tolerance. When you are working in a distributed system, um, things could uh, go down for a minute or two and you don't want to make retries manually to you want an automatism for so this again one dependency and when we go down and take a look at our color rest client we just annotate with at retry we want to have 10 retries with a delay of one second this means if the re the color service is not available then the user service will uh, try 10 times in a row on, with a one second delay and connect, uh, contact it again and again and again. And only if all checks fail, the request here fails. Otherwise, it's automatically retried. 
So I am going to restart the user service. I am going to click this away. I do not need to restart you. I have to terminate you. So the setup now is user service is running. Color service is not running. For one, we are going to click this away again. Thank you. Uh, make a post request with Bob2, Bob2 at Builder. Now the user service is running. We are going to send this request and we are going to notice the request is running. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and abort. Those were the 10 retries with a spacing of one second until, until the ser service decided no. This is now an internal service error. We get a separate error throw in, dem, in this uh, context, a H HTTP connection lost exception, which we do not uh, catch. So we see this ugly page, but for demonstration purposes, it's sufficient. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to start the color service. I'm going to wait for a specific prompt here in this console. This means I know that the color service is about five to six seconds away to start. Right now, I am going to retry this request and we will see, okay, color service is hopefully coming up. It's coming up and our request succeeds. Yeah. So we see some requests were uh, faulty, didn't get through, but as soon as the color service got up, our request passed and we had a successful connection. So second to last, there's also a possibility if the service is not reachable that we provide a default. So we just say, okay, instead of failing, here's a fallback in form of a class, class is defined down here. Um, we just say, uh, we make some logging to make it visible and we are going to return, in this case, default color, black, black for sad times. And instead of uh, trying to, confect, uh, to connect further or aborting, we are going to return this part here. Within the scope of our application, that doesn't really make sense because um, we are going to see, even if uh, we cannot validate that the color, color red is present, it's getting stored, it's just for demonstration purposes to show um, the user service is going to uh, trigger this fallback. We are going to see this lock and we are not going to fail or the request is not going to fail. So again, we will terminate the color service. We will restart the user service. Give it a second. I am going to prepare my request right here. We are going to post Bob3. Come up, come up, come up. There you are. We are going to send the request. Now we have to wait 10 seconds again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, and the request succeeded. As I said before, still the color red is persisted. Um, that's uh, since uh, Defaults don't make sense for our business case, but for demonstration purposes, we see here in our logging fallback called. So this means after the 10 requests have, um, were not able to succeed, um, the, uh, the fallback was triggered and we got our uh, fallback object. Another way to um, handle those cases would not be to um, make request, uh, make default, but um, use a circuit breaker. Circuit breaker basically says, I have a volume threshold of four right here. That means if four um, uh, requests in a succession fail, open the circuit breaker, do not try to connect the service um, behind this um, REST client, leave it open for at least 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds with the next retest, a request, try to reconnect to the service. This is meant to um, uh, 
to minimize the pressure on, on the failing system. Yeah, if you you can imagine if a system is failing, and everybody is trying to uh, connect the, to uh, to retry and retry and retry. You are actually putting more load on the system, and this is a mechanism to say no. Give the service some time. In this case, thirty seconds. Maybe it will come up again, but in this thirty seconds, we will not try to reconnect. Um, exactly. Uh, we could demonstrate it. Um, I would skip this part right now and uh, would come to an end on my part. So what have we not talked about in this talk? Um, we haven't talked about native compilation. We haven't talked about mutiny since mutiny and reactive programming in Quarkus is a different beast. Um, message queue is another big topic with I think could um, fill at least an hour on, a, uh, uh, on its own, uh, as well as camera integration. We haven't talked about Quarkus for AWS Lambda. We haven't talked about authentication authorization. This will be the topic of an, on the next talk on uh, the 12th of December. And we haven't talked about advanced topics, for example, um, context propagation, uh, multi-module and dependency injection, and so on. So, um, some resources for you if you are interested. Um, Quarkus.io, the, the official Quarkus homepage, a great resource to get started. Um, you feel, will find a lot of guides that uh, get you going quickly. Um, then there's a Quarkus Zulip chat. Um, the community and the developers are quite active, so you can uh, connect uh, to them through the uh, Zulip chat in Quarkus. And the code shown here is linked on GitHub. You can find the uh, link behind uh, this one here. Additionally, if you say, I want more, I'm interested, I want to learn, um, we as Consul offer a Quarkus workshop. If you're interested, please visit the uh, website down here and you will get some information. Whoops. So recap, what have you, we talked about? Um, we have talked about Quarkus why, what, and how. Why should we use uh, talk Quarkus? What is Quarkus and how can we use it? We have bootstrapped a, a small application, added some dependencies, and we have developed two REST microservices and have seen general tooling, REST, DI, persistence, and so on, and some specific use cases, for example, REST communication between uh, microservices, tracing with Jaeger, health check, and resiliency. Um, I would like to announce the next talk, um, also in cooperation with IBM, um, in exactly two weeks on December the second. Uh, December the second, yeah, exactly, uh, 4 p.m. CET, and we are going to look at uh, application security with Keyclose and Quarkus. Um, this will be a basic introduction to what is Keycloak, what is OAuth, but also the view and on how to implement it, how to use it on the Quarkus side, how can I use the tokens, how can I extract information. So with this, are there any questions? Let me take a look in the chat. Um, there haven't been questions in the chat. I have been monitoring it, so we answered all the ask the questions. Uh, awesome. Ask the question all the questions within the ask the question <laughs> section. So <laughs> I think um, as we are uh, 13 minutes on top of the hour, I'm going to close the call. I can just say thank you, Marco, for being here today with us. Um, I posted the links in the chat again for, the, uh, for our next session with you. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to be your host again. So <laughs> um, yeah, uh, stay tuned. and. Um, I can just say again, if you um, uh, are eager to hear more uh, on the topics on cloud native or AI, feel free to visit our IBM developer meetup. I have posted the link in the chat. And um, with regards to what you said about um, <laughs> match queue, that you didn't handle message queuing, I think our cloud native startup project from uh, Niklas Heitloff is actually uh, taking taking a look on that. So. I posted that link in the chat too, if you're interested to uh, have a deeper dive into that one. Um, so for today, all I can say, thank you for staying with us and um, for, for, for listening and being such a great audience in the chat and in the questions. And Marcus, thank you.
for, for being here for today. And I'm going to close the call um, now in uh, five seconds. I'm going to give the, the audience a chance to say thank you as well. And um, I'm going to see you next time. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to close the call. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave some time <laughs> for you to, uh, to to get the thank you. People deserve them. It was a great talk, Marco. All right, goodbye. Bye.